Now, how this plays out in our lives is this. The most clever way of all to hide from Jesus is like this. Jesus says, love your enemies. Not now, Jesus. I'm reading the Bible. I'm in the Old Testament. I'm reading about where uh, Joshua and David were killing the enemies. I love that part. Yeah. Shh, shh. Not now, Jesus. I'm, I'm reading the Bible. And you can even use the Bible to argue with Jesus, to refute Jesus, to trump Jesus. Heavens, trump Jesus. I'm conservative in my theology because Christianity is a received faith and we don't get to make it up. I'm progressive in my theology because the journey is ongoing. Feel free to argue among yourselves. Well, heart burning and still yearning. That was Brian Zond, founder and pastor of Word of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri. And we are told on the church website that he, as the lead pastor, oversees by himself, uh, apparently, the direction of the church. Now, Brian is a passionate reader of theology and philosophy, an avid hiker and mountain climber, and authority on all things Bob Dylan, which raises a torturous question. Would you rather have only Bob Dylan singing every song that ever existed, only Bob Dylan, or all the different songs that have ever existed with only Bob Dylan, with only Bob Dylan singing them. Now, that is a tough choice. Now, Brian is the author of several books, such as Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God and Postcards from Babylon. Now, all that to say, Brian is what I would call a reluctant progressive Christian. In other words, he doesn't like the term all that much, but he has all the earmarks of a progressive Christian. Hello, I'm Brian Zond, pastor of Word of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri. And I want to apologize to the gay community for the way you have been so systematically and regularly and historically vilified. The worst way, the most demonic way that we achieve unity is we pool together our own anxiety and fear and rage and project it upon some nefarious them. It's called scapegoating and it is demonic. And too often it has been gay people that have received that kind of hatred. And it's often been done by those that want to pillage the Bible to justify their hate. And I pledge that we will do better and we will make room for you. And we will seek to hear you, listen to you, understand you, and affirm over and over and over that you were unconditionally loved by Jesus Christ. And we need to join Jesus in loving you as you are. Okay. Now, that sounds pretty progressive to me. Now, we're not going to talk about homosexuality and the church. What I want to do is look at a sermon that Brian gave at the Meeting House Church in Ontario, Canada, back in October of 2017, it's a while back. Now, little did I know that the person introducing Brian is currently, today, under investigation, as are, I think, four other pastors from the same church, if you can believe it, for sexual misconduct over an extended period of time, even possibly back as far as 2017 when Brian Zond was there, but beside the fact, okay? This sermon is a good example of what progressive Christianity looks like from the pulpit. Without further ado, why don't you welcome with me Brian Zond. Thanks for being here, Brian. Thank you, Brooks. Bless you. And Meeting House, I've, uh, I've heard of you people. And now I get to be with you. This is so good. And uh, I get to preach on a bad idea. Hmm. Okay. He's actually preaching from the story of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's in all three synoptic gospels. And remember that Jesus takes his three closest disciples up on the mountain. He's praying. And while praying, his face and clothing become brilliantly white. So we'll pick it up as Brian has already read the passage, and he is now talking about, about the appearance of Moses, uh, Moses and Elijah. Well, this moment is laden with symbol. 
Because Moses and Elijah are not just towering figures in the Old Testament. They are representative figures, not only in the Old Testament, but essentially of the Old Testament. Who is Moses? Moses is the lawgiver. Okay. He is the embodiment of the Torah, the law. Who is Elijah? Elijah is the iconic prophet, the quintessential prophet. So to say Moses and Elijah is to say the law and the prophets. Okay, that's, that's not all that difficult to understand. But what Brian does next is to prop up the law and the prophets as ends in themselves. And so the law and the prophets have this design that the people of God might be a worshiping and just society. When Jesus comes and begins his preaching ministry, at the very beginning he says, now don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish but to fulfill. In other words, what the law and the prophets were trying to achieve but never actually fully able to accomplish, Jesus says, in the bringing of the kingdom of God, I am going to fulfill that. Okay, Brian's contention is that the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, was a blueprint to point to God's uh, people towards being a worshiping and just society. Brian says that the law and the prophets were not able to accomplish that, and so Jesus comes and he brings in the kingdom, kingdom and he accomplishes what the law and the prophets could not bring about. Now, that's a little strange, but let's keep going. Moses and Elijah appear on Mount Tabor to bear their final witness and to hand the project off to the one who will fulfill it. Hmm. That's the symbol. That's the message of Moses and Elijah with Jesus on the holy mountain. All right, Brian seems to be missing the crucial aspect of this story, and that is that Jesus momentarily revealed the glory he possessed from all eternity as God's one and only eternal Son. In the incarnation, when God became man, born of a virgin, this glory was veiled. But for a moment, up on that mountain, his closest disciples were allowed to go and, and get a tiny glimpse of that eternal glory. And we get a small clue as to what Moses and Elijah were doing when they were speaking to Jesus in Luke 9.31, where we read, they spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Then, like the glory cloud that filled the temple and the voice that spoke when Jesus was baptized, God speaks. And he speaks really to the disciples and says, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. And when Peter, James, and John open their eyes and look around, no more Moses, no more Elijah, but it says, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. Because you see, Jesus is what God has to say. Okay, you see where this is going, don't you? Now, I agree that as Hebrews tells us, in these last days, he, God, has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. But it appears that Brian's desire is to shed all the problematic stuff we find in the Old Testament. I mean, after all, it is the 21st century. And all those things like killings and blood and judgment, all that stuff is anything but progressive. But the church misunderstands this. The church says, oh, we have the law and the prophets and Jesus. And we'll just make the Bible a flat text where every verse of the Bible carries equal authority, where every verse of the Bible will be regarded as having the same capacity for revelation regarding who God is. We'll just treat the Bible as a flat text. We'll have the law, and we'll have the prophets, and we'll have Jesus, and we'll treat it all more or less the same. And God said, that's a bad idea. You will not. So I guess the Apostle Paul was full of bad ideas. Remember, during the first century, all Christians had, they, all they had was the Old Testament from which Christ was preached. I mean, look at Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 15, starting at verse 1. 
We read, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now that's a quote from Psalms. From whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. He goes on to quote from 2 Samuel, from Deuteronomy, and Isaiah. You see, the Old Testament is as much the word of God and just as authoritative as the New Testament. Now, Brian will now use a story from Luke chapter 9 to show how you can use the Bible to trump Jesus. This story happens after the transfiguration, where the people of a Samaritan village refuse to welcome Jesus. They, uh, James and John, well, they're outraged at what happened, and they ask Jesus to judge them with fire from heaven, alluding to the Old Testament account of Elijah in 1 Kings. James and John love that story. They learned it in... Sunday school or Sabbath school or something. They liked it. And they said, Jesus, can we do that? It's in the Bible, you know. Must be God's will. It's in the Bible. Can we do that? And Jesus says, what is wrong with you? That's a bad idea. The Son of Man did not come to destroy lives, but to save them. Do you see how you can use the Bible to trump Jesus? <laughs> You know, Brian sounds like a red letter Christian. You know, only the words of Jesus really matter. But the fact of the matter is this, the whole Bible should be red letter because the whole Bible is inspired by the triune God. The apostle Paul writes to Timothy and he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, the basic question is, what was Jesus' view of the Old Testament? Well, John 10 is very helpful here. The Jews want to stone Jesus for saying, I and the Father are one. And Jesus says to them, is it not written in your law, which was his law too, I said you are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, hmm, do you say of him whom the father uh, consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God? Jesus here quotes Psalms, but he calls it the law, meaning the entire Old Testament. Jesus uses the Old Testament in other places as well. While being tempted by Satan, remember, in the wilderness, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy a couple times and the Psalms. The same Deuteronomy that tells us that when God delivered the nations occupying Canaan over, the, over to the Israelites, they were to, to devote themselves, uh, I should say, they were to devote those pagan nations to complete destruction. They were to make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. But you see, this was not ethnic cleansing. It was ethical cleansing. I mean, these people were pagans. They were God haters. Hebrews 8.13 teaches us this. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. Now, since the old covenant has become obsolete because, because of a new and better covenant, we are now to understand the Old Testament in light of the New Testament and the New Testament with its redemptive historical connection to the Old Testament. See, the problem with... Biblical, you know, biblical principles. Let's, let's govern according to biblical principles. Well, you can administrate the institution of slavery according to biblical principles. Yes, this is one of the embarrassing things about the Bible. The Bible does not present ever in Old or New Testaments a clear denunciation of slavery, but it seems to accept it as an inevitable institution. Okay, okay. Now, 
In one sense, Brian is correct. You won't find a command anywhere in scripture that specifically states you shall have uh, no slaves, okay? And we do not find the practice of slavery or bond servanthood. It, it, I should say we do, if I didn't say that right, we do find the practice of both um, slavery and bond servanthood, which is really what it is in both the Old and New Testaments. Even though just with a little bit of uh, digging on the matter, one will find that it doesn't at all resemble the ethnic slavery where a person of one people group becomes the property of a person from a more powerful people group against their will. But what we do find in the New Testament is Paul's letter to Philemon, where Paul exhorts Philemon to no longer consider his runaway bondservant. His name was on on Onesimus. Yeah, Onesimus. He was his slave or his bondservant. But rather, Paul says, he should treat him and look at him as a beloved brother, both in the flesh, you know, human beings created in God's image, and more importantly, in the Lord. We also find a really good summation of the moral law when a lawyer asks Jesus, which is the great commandment in the law? And in Matthew 22, 37, Jesus says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You're not going to make yourself a slave, right? And, and Jesus is saying, love your neighbor as yourself, okay? There is the summation of the Old Testament, actually. It's also interesting to note that in the Westminster Larger Catechism, when discussing the duties required of a Christian who now, not to be saved, but now out of gratitude, endeavors to keep the eighth commandment, you shall not steal, it says this, the duties required in the eighth commandment are truth, faithfulness, and justice in contracts and commerce between man and man, rendering to everyone his due. You see, no slaves, um, you, you treat people with respect and you pay them for the work that they perform for you. You see, this would make the whole notion of modern slavery completely antithetical to biblical Christianity. So when you hear someone using Moses and Elijah to trump Jesus, when you hear someone appealing to David and Joshua to argue with Jesus, you know that you've heard a bad idea because Jesus is what God has to say. Okay, I have never heard anybody use Moses or Elijah and, and Joshua to argue or to trump Jesus. But what I am hearing from Brian troubles me greatly. If Jesus is what God has to say at the expense of the rest of the, or I should say the entire Old Testament, then the Bible is two thirds not inspired nor authoritative. Now, I don't know if Brian is a full-blown progressive Christian or not. He kind of sounds like it. But be on the lookout for these markers listed in a quote from Elisa Childers. They're not always easy to spot and sometimes denied. But if you take a look at what's actually being taught, you just might see it. She writes this. In the progressive church, the Bible is viewed more like an ancient spiritual travel journal than the inspired, inerrant, and authoritative Word of God. The Bible writers are viewed as well-meaning, ancient people who were doing their best to understand God in the times and places in which they lived, but they were not necessarily speaking for God. Scripture is also seen as contradictory, as not internally coherent, and not authoritative for Christians. And uh, so, so my point isn't necessarily to call Jonathan Edwards to task. It's simply I'm telling my own story. Right. That there was a time when I preached, you know, an angry God, and I've been through a transformation, and I want to help people understand that ultimately the best thing I can say is God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There's never been time that God wasn't like Jesus. The thing is we haven't always known that, but now we do. Hmm. Okay. 
So what is Jesus like? Uh, is it just the meek and mild Jesus that preaches the Beatitudes uh, in, the, in the fifth chapter of Matthew? Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, um, sorry about that. There's a comma and an A. I don't know what that is. You have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So these are, these are unbelievers who will not escape this coming sudden destruction when the Lord Jesus returns. Now, let's look at this. What will happen when Jesus returns? Well, this is a picture of what will happen, okay? It's, it's visionary language, it's, it's picture language, it's from the 19th chapter of Revelation, the starting at verse 11, 19 uh, chapter of, of uh, Revelation. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and sitting on it is called, the one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. He called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both great and are small and great. And then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who was in its presence had done all the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. Those who were thrown alive. These, I should say, sorry, my glasses, I think, are fogging up or they're getting probably smudged. Sorry about that. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. You see, all the things we see, the conquest of Canaan and the, the, the expulsion of the nations in that Canaan area and, and showing them no mercy, that is picture of what will happen at the great and terrible day of the Lord when, the G, when Jesus uh, glorified Jesus, now in heaven, ruling and reigning by the right hand of the, uh, at the right hand of the Father, returns again <laughs> to judge the living and the dead. This is Jesus we have to deal with, okay? Jesus is good, he's merciful, he's honest, he's loving. But there's also a side to Jesus, if Brian wants to focus on Jesus, that is angry with proper reason, with righteousness, right? And that's nothing more, God's anger is nothing more than his wrath. And if, if God wasn't wrathful, against un, injustice and, and, and uh, sinfulness, he wouldn't be a good God. He would not be a good God. So this is the Jesus with which we have to do. And I'm afraid that Brian has gone the, the way of, really it's warmed over liberalism. I don't know what he thinks about miracles, but to try to just bifurcate the Old Testament from the New Testament, you're all of a sudden giving us another gospel. You're giving us another gospel. So be on the lookout for progressive Christianity. It's, it's seeping in like, like, like a gas, you know, underneath the, uh, the, the door seal. And it's, it's deadly. It's going to be more and more seen in, in modern evangelicalism. So watch out for it. Watch out for it.